And uh, Rishi is from the Cleveland Clinic, and he's going to share with you some innovative studies that they're doing uh, at the Cole Eye Center. Thanks. So I don't know how many of you were at Retina Subspecialty Day today, but one of the things that came out a lot was all these talks on anti-VEGF therapy for, for DME. And one of the, the things about it is that you realize after you look at these studies how impure they are in some senses, that they, they involve laser in many different factors and, and, and ways they treat the patient. Um, there was a study that was looking at uh, treat and extending protocols with additional laser as well. So it, the real question I think uh, I wanted to ask, and I, this is the, the talk I've created on it, is is laser dead for diabetic macroedema? I mean, you've seen all these studies now that have come out in the last couple of years, and you really wonder. And, and this is just a representative case. This is a 68-year-old gentleman um, uh, with a, a really focal DME. Uh, superior to the fovea here, um, and he has not received any previous treatment. And the question is, what do you do with this sort of patient now? Because if you follow the, some of the studies you're seeing nowadays, you're seeing a, a, a movement to anti-VEGF therapy, because that is supposedly king. And what you can realize is there's lots of drawbacks to the use of anti-VEGF therapy in these patients. So I'm just going to talk about how I take care of this patient, for example, uh, through the course of this, this talk. So we see lots of different papers that have come out in the past few years. Uh, the Reed study, other anti-VEGF studies using both Lucentis, Avastin, and soon ILEA. And all of them have highlighted the same sort of thing, is that there is obviously an improvement in visual acuity, improvement in the anatomical change, but is there a need for better? Do you need to have better here? Um, and the answer, I think, when you look at your options is that you have anti-VEGF, laser, steroids, combination treatment, even surgery for DME. And these are the kinds of studies that have kind of highlighted those results and those outcomes. Um, so let's look at some of the results from those studies. So here are the results from the RISE and RIDE studies. These were, were with Lu, Lucentis for diabetic macular edema. And what you can see basically is there is an improvement in visual acuity of three lines or more in about 40% of patients over the sham control. Now sham doesn't mean that they didn't receive anything. Both arms of this study received laser. And one of the things you should note about the study is that at day zero, the patients that were randomized to the sham arm never got laser. In fact, they were only given laser at 90 days following the initial treatment. So this wasn't a fair comparison of laser versus anti-VEGF treatment because if that was the case, if you were designing this trial, you would have said day zero I would have applied both laser and one patient and anti-VEGF on the other. And that's unfortunately was not done in this, this study. Nonetheless, it shows the curves of the visual acuity over time in patients who got anti-VEGF therapy and each of these arms were eligible to get laser. Um, this is the uh, outcome results of the vision over that time. What I want to point out here is that basically when you see this uh, curve of three lines of gain of vision, and they call what on the bottom of this slide is visual stability right here. Um, visual stability is something that I think that you have to consider in what the definition is. So visual stability is you can lose two lines of vision and still be called visually stable. Well, that's not what I tell my patients because my patients don't want to hear that they're going to lose two lines of vision. I want to tell them that they can maintain their vision and if not improve their vision. So when you actually look at this, you say that about 60% of patients are visually stable, but still 40% of patients who get anti-VEGF therapy, albeit monthly, and a, and a regimen that probably none of us use in this room, uh, still lose vision over time. And so I think that's important to consider when you look at these sort of trials as well. Um, this is the number of injections they received and uh, the mean number of treatments. The lasers are on the lower right corner here. And what I want to just point out is that even after 12 injections of ranibizumab over 12 months, 40% of them needed additional laser in that group. So what does that tell you? This was not a, a, a naive study where you were just giving anti-VEGF alone. These patients were combination patients. Really what they were showing was a combination treatment was what benefited most of the patients in the trial. These are the patients who developed iris neovascularization, uh, retinal uh, neovascularization, and vitreous hemorrhage. And what I want to show you in, in both the um, ranibizumab groups is that they weren't isolated. They were isolated patients that did get neovascularization. So the risk of retinopathy progression is not zero. So what what are the the reasons why um, you 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 also be worried about anti-VEGFs. Well, we talk about the ocular AEs and the, the systemic AEs, and these adverse events we're talking about were just highlighted at 4.30 by doc, Dr. Avery, Dr. Rosenfeld, and a few other people. And what they showed us was that basically you have all these really large studies now that have shown that when you give these anti-VEGF injections, they actually get into the systemic circulation, whether you like it or not. So when you give Avastin or ILEA, they do get in the systemic circulation, and they have potential side effects. And those side effects are things like wound healings, arterial stromboic events, 
uh, dyspnea, stroke, things like that. So you have to be concerned about these things when you give these anti-vegetophagians as, as rapidly as we do um, in, in our current state of uh, treatment. Now, what do these treatments not do? Well, the treatments that we give, anti-VEGF theremins, don't eliminate hypoxia. And that's one of the great things about laser is that when you, when you apply laser, you're eliminating retinal hypoxia. They've shown that in multiple studies. We know that from PRP studies we do that, and, and giving laser does eliminate retinal hypoxia and neovascularization stimuli. Um, the number of injections that we give over extended periods is really what's burdening our practice. So if you can give an anti-VEGF injection over 12 months and every day see that patient, every month see that patient, give them an injection, that's fantastic. The vast majority of us cannot do that. So we need other therapies that may increase what we call our durability or our, our final durability of what we're giving them over time and how can we do that sort of thing. Um, not all people gain vision, some people lose vision and the side effects are low but not zero. Again, endophthalmitis is a devastating side effect from giving an injection which you would never get from a laser procedure in the first place. What about combination treatment? So when we talk about laser plus anti-VEGF, we have a couple studies to look at. And this is a drc net study, which again showed in the top line, um, uh, the orange and the blue are both ranibizumab with prompt and deferred laser. They were not ranibizumab alone. Why did the study participants decide to do this? Because they realized that laser is an effective way of treating some patients in your, in your course of therapy. And so you should consider that as one of your options. So let's talk about why laser therapy really hasn't succeeded. So we know from all these studies that you've seen poor visual acuity responses to laser. And, and this is probably um, not representative of the truth because of the fact that we see that um, the, the differences in treatments that we all do. So one of the things that navigated laser has allowed us to do is re -produce, uh, produce the accuracy and reproducibility of what we do. So I train residents and fellows. It makes me lose hair on my head <laughs> by training them, but it's fun. And one of the fun things about it is teaching them how to do a focal laser. And it's, it's actually good with focal laser to show them that there is a, a way of treating these patients in a certain fashion that is more reproducible and more accurate with the Navalos laser than it has been before. When you look at three lines of gain of vision with laser, again, you see that same sort of effect. So why don't you see that sort of change in, in the three lines of gains? Well, I think it's because when we look at these treatments, we don't necessarily always treat microaneurysms. We may be just treating as a grid. And it's hard to, to target microaneurysms, especially in a moving patient. And one of the nice things about Navalos is that you can actually not use a lens to hold on the patient's eye. The patient just sits in the machine and you can tar target where you're going to treat that microaneurysm uh, right away. Um, there have been some studies that were done at the Retina Society this year that looked at what were called um, salmon. Did anyone see those, those studies at all? Salmon, salmon patches in the retina? They're where they're basically seeing one microaneurysm feed an entire area of edema. And when you treat this one microaneurysm, um, the Japanese stu studies have shown this, is that you can reduce the complete edema that you see in that area by treating what they call the salmon. And uh, that's something that is really uh, interesting to look at for, for the future for treating these patients. I think that the, one of the other problems has been laser has been the poor uptake and the variability of treatment. When a patient moves or the patient lo loses fixation, you end up treating the wrong area. You may not treat the edema. I can tell you myself, I've looked at enough patients under a lens that I can't tell where the edema sometimes begins and ends because I don't have the ability to do a visual OCT on them. So I may look like the edema is starting at one point when in fact it's starting at a very different point by examination. And, and finally, poor targeting of these areas. So the purpose of my study, which I've done over the past six months, is really to evaluate what, what traditional focal has done in my patients versus navigated laser. And this was a, a combination of, of a prospective arm and a retrospective arm. The prospective was patients who were going, undergoing treatment with Navalos with a navigated laser. And there were patients who were in a retrospective analysis, the arm, the control arm, were getting traditional focal laser in my clinic um, uh, under, under my guidance as well. And when we looked at is one month and three month outcomes, because at one month, you know, you tend to get frustrated and say, well, I'll wait a month and see if the laser does anything. But by about two, one month afterward, you're saying, well, I'll just migrate to anti-VEGF therapy. So we wanted to see both one month and three month outcomes. Uh, we did um, uh, the, the focals under OCT guidance with a navigated laser, and we looked at central subfield thickness, cube average thickness, cube volume, uh, and using that OCT over time. And this is an interim analysis that we planned on thus far. So we've enrolled about um, 
three quarters of the patients we have in this trial, but you can see clearly that there is a difference in the retinal thicknesses, which is almost almost uh, approaching cystal significance in this group now, um, where it didn't where we are, we're now at the interim time point for the study. So at the top line showing the iridex laser, which we typically use for all our focals, where the retinal thickness at one month really didn't change, in fact may have even gotten worse. But in the bottom line, we're seeing improved retinal thickness changes with our navigated laser approach. And up to month three now, we're seeing significant changes as well. So we're at the interim time point where we're doing this analysis. And this gives you those absolute values or changes over time where you can see a, a huge reduction in retinal thickness. And one of the things I point out when I show this slide is that you look at this and it's 40 and 50 microns of difference. I don't think any of us in this room would have thought that focal laser would cause 40 or 50 microns of difference within the first month. And that's what I, we actually see when we use navigated laser in these patients. I think that's an impressive result. So let's go back to that patient I told you about from the beginning who we were treating. So this is that patient here. This is the OCT um, uh, image, and I overlaid this onto the fundus image. And I apologize because the black background is dark, but basically I've, I've done my treatment plan for this patient. I've marked their, their foveal center, and I've treated this patient. And this is uh, nine months now after treatment. Um, I, the, this is actually the scan that was done six weeks after his first treatment. So he got a scan done six weeks afterward, showed a reduction of almost 60 microns in the central subfield, and actually never needed uh, recurrent uh, treatment after this at nine months out. So this is the one and done effect. It's not for every patient, but this is somebody you have in your practice. This is somebody who treat, you may say just, I would have tra treated them with anti-VEGF therapy. But that's a maintenance you have to continue, and I think focal laser still has a role today in, in the, patient, the treatment of these patients. So just to summarize again, I think um, there's a broad spectrum of DME. Some of them lead, lead to uh, treatment with focal laser. I'm not saying all of them do, uh, but I think that some of them definitely do, and I think it, it still serves a role in the practice we take care of. Um, our overall goal as physicians is to reduce frequency, reduce burden to our patients overall, and navigated laser for me and my practice has done that. Um, and again, to reduce the progression to PDR and TRD, which can occur again with removal of the uh, retinal hypoxia we do with laser. And finally, navigated approach may improve our outcomes and decrease the treatment burden and also improve retinal thickness outcomes to the level of anti-VEGF, but we're still doing that study and that's what the ongoing study is. We should complete our enrollment by December of this year. So, thank you. So, Rishi, can you comment? Do you sure. target the aneurysms and do grid? Or yes. Do yes. No, and, and, and actually, the, the nice thing about that is that when you get into the, before you get into the laser, you're really able to sit down and, and target all the aneurysms that you'd see, whereas when you're sitting with a patient and they might complain of the lens being on their eye or some other issue and that you, they may defixate, that you can't really target the aneurysms as well. And um, uh, that's one of the real advantages I found is that I can really target microaneurysms. And there's been some thought, and you know these papers as well as I do, is that there's been some thought that if you just target the microaneurysms alone, that you really don't need to even do the grid portion of the whole laser. I, I think you're right. Yeah. You suggested it's true that out of all of our laziness, a lot yes. of people, they just do a grid. Right. Doing the aneurysms without this is right. very difficult. Right. And actually, when the ETDRS was done, a color fundus photo, if you don't know this, but a color yeah. fundus photo was taken, <laughs> yeah. sent to the reading center. I, yeah. tell you, I had to then go back and retreat the patient because yeah. I didn't hit it. So yeah. no one's doing that. Yeah, I, I think it's become much harder, and I think as people train and the volume becomes greater, we're just spending less time doing this sort of thing, and there's an art of doing it. And I think this has allowed us to get back to that art in some Mishy, senses. Can you comment on whether you use uh, the newest software, yeah. you can switch to a color image? Yeah. I've been asked about this, but maybe you can comment on so we actually haven't gotten the upgrade yet, but I will tell you, I've Wait, seen it in, in D <laughs> we, we've seen in the demo. So one of the nice things about it is that when you, when you actually deliver the burn, it shows you a, a, a large, large uh, blow up of the burn. I've seen it in, in, in the demo form, but I actually haven't had it in my own laser yet. Uh, it's something that I really would love to have and look at and use it more frequently. Um, but right now what I've been doing is post and pre-treatment photographs that have been allowing me to follow it. I, it's reasonable to do, but I, I can't wait to have that upgrade to have that change happen. So. Okay. Thank you. Great.